Um, so uh, before I start, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, I am the head of data science at Dow Jones, uh, but before becoming a data scientist, I spent many years first at Carnegie Mellon University and then at IBM Research, uh, trying to have machines understand human language and human speech, including translation, dialogue, dialogue analysis, speech recognition. So that very, very interesting problem. So uh, as you're gonna see, uh, this applies very, very well to the problem that we're trying to uh, address at uh, Dow Jones. Okay, so um, at Dow Jones, uh, we work, we produce content, we produce information. And as we heard this morning, one very simple way to characterize information is to divide it in structured data and unstructured data. And uh, Structured data, as we've been hearing, actually is very, is very good, it's very friendly. It's information uh, that you can plug directly into your models. Uh, structured data is information that you can visualize. Structured data is, uh, is very clean and is very straightforward, right? And is very useful. Uh, however, data doesn't occur always comes in a structured way, right? Uh, most of the time, as we heard this morning as well, uh, data comes in unstructured uh, ways, right? Like for example, right now I'm speaking with you and you can get the audio of this presentation and that's a waveform or you can get the transcript and that's text form. We produce a lot of uh, articles from uh, the Wall Street Journal, Factiva, and that's unstructured data that comes and information that people can read, uh, pictures that people can see and so on. So most of the data that exists and is being produced is, comes on a structured, unstructured way. Interestingly, the products that Dow Jones produces can also be understood in, these two, uh, in this dichotomy, right? So we have at the top Factiva and at the bottom the Wall Street Journal, and those are unstructured data sets, right? People get their newspaper, read it in the morning, and while risk and compliance, some of you might be familiar with it, is a structured data set. It's a set that contains names of people who are, have a heightened profile of risk. And the risk can be of different natures. And these people and these entities, could be corporations, are located around the world, and some of them are interconnected. So that's an example of a product that we uh, generate that is on structured data. So during this talk, I will give you a guided tour of what entails to go from unstructured data, this massive amount of data that is constantly being produced around us, and go all the way to this distilled, simple, nice, beneficial, structured data sets. As you can imagine, it's a very, it's, 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 a, it's a complex problem, and I'll give you here a, a guided tour. Okay, so, um, so first, talking about structured data, as we heard, as we heard um, uh, structured data, as, as I said, is uh, very useful because we can plug it into our models, we can do machine learning, we can do prediction, and we can do a lot of uh, quantitative analysis based on that. Uh, another thing that structured data is very good for is visualization. So uh, my team, has, we have been working on uh, creating a prototype of a tool that demonstrates that simply adding a visual and interactive front end to, an unstructured, sorry, to a structured data set is very valuable. So as I said, uh, Dow Jones produces the risk and compliance data set, and it's a collection of names and uh, of entities that are names of organizations, as I said, that have a heightened profile risk. Once you create a front end, uh, then you can visualize different aspects, and actually you can I learn different information that is very hard to get on just on tables of, or lists of names. Specifically, uh, in this case, I'm showing you the screenshot of the tool when, we, when the query is Osama bin Laden, right? So you can start by looking at the graph on the left. It's a network. It's a visualization of Osama bin Laden and the entities in the data set that are related to Osama bin Laden. Uh, the circles represent people, the triangles represent organizations, the colors represent the type of category that they have, and the relationships, that is the, the lines between the, the circles or the triangles, can be of different type, right? And uh, can be, pro for example, uh, business or political uh, relationships, or it could be family relationships. So these data sets, as you can infer, they were manually, manually curated, they are very high quality, painstakingly created, and now we can take this information, visualize it, and actually see interesting things. For example, the, the collection of uh, relations for Osama bin Laden includes a lot of yellow circles, right? Um, so those are people, 
And actually, we can see that uh, the dominant color for the relationships is are associated SIP. So there's a lot of people who are associated to Osama bin Laden who are, or by themselves have a high profile uh, risk. And, uh, and they're not family. They're not political relationships. Uh, the, the picture on the left is what we call the micro, net, the macro network. That's the big picture, right? So all the per people in the data set that ultimately can be connected to Osama bin Laden, and that tells you a lot about the, stru the structure of the relationships in these kind of uh, groups. Uh, you can find politicians, you can find businessmen, you can find actors, you can find uh, a lot of famous people, and they, essentially the structures of the graphs are very different. The colors that dominate the graphs, you can see a lot of blue circles here, for example, there are yellow circles, as I mentioned. Once you overlay the data on a map, you can actually visualize where those relationships are across geographies. The arcs of the colors tells you, you know, what's the nature of, the, of those uh, relationships. And then you can use social network algorithms like network centrality to find out or compute who are the important people in those, con in those networks, right? Who are the central people, the people who have more, uh, uh, who have more uh, contribution in building that specific network. So this is visualization of structured data. Now, this is an example of uh, unstructured data. So it's an article. I'm not going to have you read all of it, but essentially the, the summary of the content is described in the first sentence. So Instagram essentially has disabled support for images through Twitter's cards function, right? So it's about Instagram and it's about t Twitter, right? It tells you all about Facebook, that Instagram was acquired by Facebook. It, it brings some opinion that was voiced by the CEO of Instagram by Mark Zuckerberg there. So, so that's essentially the typical article, right? So how, we go, how do we go from this kind of like, a, you know, stream of millions or thousands of these articles and we distill the information that we're interested? And remember, that information could be things that we know that we don't know, or it could be things that we don't know that we don't know, right? So that's the, the, the next challenge. So, how can, we use, how can we extract the information, the, the structural information from unstructured data? Well, there are two ways of doing it. One, that is uh, manually, that is we can hire people. The people can be analysts and can be generating hypotheses and going through the data and trying to find the support on the data that essentially backs these hypotheses. And uh, it produces high quality output, but is, as you can imagine, very time consuming and very costly. If something happens, like an event that you know, is moving at a fast speed and suddenly that generates a lot of connections, well, your team is going to have to work very fast to represent that uh, on a timely fashion on the data set. We can go automatically, and automatically the advantage is that it's scalable. We can throw computers at the problem and it can run, fa run faster. But the problem is that finding high quality and high resolution output, the same level that a human would do, is actually an AI problem that is AI hard, right? It's difficult. So if we could have a computer that could understand text with the level of, uh, at the level of a human do, you know, we would have cracked the AI problem. So the, there is a third approach that is the hybrid process. So we can harness the computational pro, uh, uh, you know, computing power to start generating hypotheses that we then provide to humans, and humans verify those, and then we use learning algorithms to propagate those back into our computation approaches, and then close the loop and do this iteratively and improve our systems, right, efficiently. So that's the type of approach that uh, we're trying to develop at uh, Dow Jones. All right, so here, as I said, this is essentially a guided tour of how this, the magic happens, right? So, uh, Essentially here, the first step that I do, and I'm gonna go through the steps, right, in a, in a very simplified way, is to detect the entity. So in a very light color, and I ap apologize that it's not darker, uh, the first pass, you can detect the entities, and that's a very straightforward, you can go through name entities, or proper names in this case, Every mention that you focus, that you find that is Instagram, you color blue, uh, Twitter is gonna be color red, Facebook is slightly green, and so on and so forth, right? So we have here those three main entities, Instagram, Facebook, and, and Twitter. As, as you can see, they are spread around the text. However, that, that's the first step. The next step is really try to go and find deeper understanding. And as I said, you know, there are relationships that we know they are there, is we just have to discover them. And there are also new relationships that we might not even know about. In this case, for example, uh, Instagram did something that disabled a Twitter 
feature. So it could be perhaps something, it's an adversarial business action that our taxonomy, and we heard about taxonomies this morning, might not contain. So we, need, we might need to represent or extend our taxonomy. So to do that, to be able to understand the text at a, at a deeper level, we do what is a, a syntactic parsing. We parse the whole content, right? Now, interestingly, and here is the, the syntax parsing of the first sentence, you see how uh, the first sentence already contains the two key entities of the text, Inter Instagram and Twitter, right? You can see Instagram and then a parenthetical uh, uh, phrase that says a photo sharing startup that Facebook bought this year for what was about $1 billion. So that's kind of like between commas. And see how our parsing identified that is between commas up there and the top. Uh, is you can remove that and the content of the sentence doesn't change. It's really about Instagram uh, has disabled support for, for images through Twitter's uh, cards function, right? So that's essentially the key of the whole article. Now, as you can see, there are also embedded a lot of structure that says MP and VP. Those are noun phrases and verb phrases. So because we're humans and we know what the content is, you can actually reverse engineer. And you can find out that the key relationship between Instagram and Twitter in this, in this sentence is associated to that verb phrase, has disabled support for images. Right? So if I can just mine those three components, the word Instagram, the word Twitter, associated to their entities, and then kind of summarize what's the nature of this article through these few words, then that's a good step. I can do that at scale. Right, so that's the challenge. The problem is that language is very ambiguous. So one classical example in computational linguistics is uh, time flies like an arrow. I think Noam Chomsky uh, proposed that sentence and he said, you know, there are like seven ways to understand or parse that sentence, right? So you can imagine what's gonna happen with sentences that are very large. So I was mentioning earlier that here there is a problem with the word disabled, right? Disabled can be an adjective or it can be a, 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 ten, a verb in a passive tense. In this case, it should be a verb in a passive a tense, and that, that parsing can introduce, this, those different parsings can introduce a lot of problems. So our method should be robust to uh, accommodate all those variations on the parsing or understanding of sentences that are ambiguous. And again, language is ambiguous. That's the biggest problem of la natural language understanding. So, the third step, so, I, as I, so the first is identify the entities, uh, the second is do the parsing. And the third step is to find now all those uh, uh, pronouns, personal pronouns, right? Like I highlighted in red all the me, I, you, we, right? Now all of them refer to somebody, right? When somebody, when that uh, sentence in the fourth paragraph is saying what we realized over time was that we really needed to build an awesome web presence recently, we launched and we, 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 right? So it's Instagram, that we really refers to Instagram. So before we do large scale analysis and start mining data and crunching data, we need to resolve that we in those instances refer, refers to Instagram. So notice, notice that by virtue of adding all these we's and I's and personal pronouns, actually I'm extending the number of entities in this text, right? I pretty much almost doubled it, right? So now it's about 30, that I, 30 uh, mentions that I have to uh, deal with. So the next step is doing what is called co-reference resolution that essentially is putting together in buckets the we's and in instances that refer to the same entity. So here is just a little cut of the view of the JSON after the entity uh, co-reference resolution was uh, resolved. And you can see, for example, Systrom that is on the zeroed, uh, on the zeroed uh, sentence and CEO Kevin Systrom that is on the second sentence and Systrom that is on the seventh sentence and so on and so forth. This is just a cut image. Actually, they were bundled together into the same entity, right? Kevin Systrom, the CEO of uh, Instagram. On the right, we can find Instagram. See how very interesting the phrase became an entity, right? The, a photo sharing startup that Facebook bought this year for what was, 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 was one billion at the time. The third mention is Instagram. So all of them came together, and we should be able to not only take care of the we's and the personal pronouns, but also those phrases that refer to Instagram, that define Instagrams, right? So we do that, it's co-reference resolution. And after that, we have co-reference resolution, we have all the mentions, we have the structures that associate one to each other. Now we can do some sort of aggregate summarization and present those hypotheses to the, to the analysts. So what are the challenges? So, you know, as I show you, there are tools, there are ways of doing this. You know, it's really exciting, it's uh, lots of fun. 
But let's do a little bit back of the envelope calculation. So the first is, um, it's possible that I have to process two million documents per day, right? So with a little bit of uh, news wires and content from uh, newspapers and some social media, I might easily end up with two million documents a day. That's not, that's not really uh, unusual. Um, now, the sample document that I show had 30 mentions, right? After doing all the pronouns and all that uh, stuff, uh, it has 30 mentions. So um, I know that the dictionary, a typical dictionary of names and companies is about three to four million uh, entities, right? This is a dictionary that has three to four million unique entities. So if you multiply 30 entity mentions per article times two million, you're gonna have that, in your, that per day, you're gonna have 60 million entities. But you don't have 60 million, a dictionary of 60 million different entities. You have to map them down to those three to four million entities, and that's called conflation, right? And that's a very interesting, and cha it's another challenge, challenging problem in the pipeline. So you have to do all this analysis, conflate the entities across different articles, start processing all the relationships, and you need to do that in the two million articles. Now, the, the other interesting back of the envelope calculation is that if we assume that this uh, document that we saw take us one second to process, you do the math, two million articles to process at one second each is gonna require 555 CPU hours per day. So either you use one machine, one CPU for 555 hours, or you use 555 CPUs for one hour, or some combination like that. So how do you do that? Through parallelization. So may, most of you, uh, many of you, uh, might have heard about all these uh, big data platforms, right? Including Hadoop, right? So Hadoop actually is a perfect platform to parallelize this task. You have your two million documents. You have something that is computationally relatively in, in, intense to do at the individual document level. And then you collate all the results in a, in a second pass. So Hadoop does present you with a paradigm of map reduce in which in the mappers, you kind of crunch and parse and do all these kind of article level analysis, and then you coalesce or bring together, collate all your information and do a global analysis. Like for example, the global conflation, the, uh, the reduction of all your syntax uh, realizations and uh, the summarization, the generation of hypotheses, and so on and so forth. So uh, we're actually creating our pipeline in a Hadoop MapReduce uh, framework in a parallelized way. And this is a way also the benefit is that you can leverage elastic platforms like Amazon's or Google computing um, engine and you know, call, pay for those 555 instances of machines for one hour. All right, so this uh, brings me to the end of the presentation. I talked about the problem of extracting information, right? What's behind, you know, what's the magic behind info, uh, you know, discovering all these relationships and providing them to humans for, for manual annotation? Uh, what we have in mind in, uh, in the team is to actually explore other additional new, new uh, avenues uh, for, for improvement. One of them, uh, and I'm gonna go through them, uh, the first one is to rather than work on batches, right, to wait for the two million articles to be there ready for you, you can actually process them in real time. That's called stream processing. So doing more as the article or the content comes, don't wait until the end of the day, just process it in real time. It's a slightly different paradigm, but uh, we're exploring also methods of doing that. The next one is uh, supervised and semi-supervised methods. We heard earlier about machine learning. It's a supervised method if you, you, know, you back learn your, your algorithm. Uh, here in supervised and semi-supervised, what you would do is you would present the hypothesis to humans and, the hum and the, the, from the results you would learn all the features so then you can actually try it or attempt to do the, the discovery in a completely unsupervised way. Uh, if you do semi-supervised, another uh, paradigm that is very interested in is crowdsourcing, right? You can find incentives to give to the crowd and find, you know, uh, tell, ask people, you know, if, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, give them this task and kind of have them be the experts from which you generate your supervised data. Another third uh, area that is actually very interesting is the interaction of different data sets. So as I said, we, we have the, um, we're publishers of the Wall Street Journal and we have the web logs. We, we know that uh, when content gets published, People go read using their tablets or on the desktops. So we know what's really the behavior of humans around you know, readers and subscribers and anonymous readers uh, on, on the content. So, so it's very interesting, would be very interesting. It's not only a temporal signal as we saw on when the information is generated, but also what the signal is of how is the interest or the consumption of that content uh, on the web or digital uh, methods. 
Uh, finally, uh, the last two is, um, you know, we talk about very factual based articles, right? Like Facebook did this and Twitter did that, did that to Instagram and so on and so forth, right? But there's another type of content that is very subtle, like opinion or editorial, right? So that's not really about facts. The facts are not going to be stated in your first sentence and it's going to have the two entities and the relationship. It's very subtle and requires another paradigm. So we are also very interested in looking into uh, things that are more editorial, perhaps more politically related, uh, more of a different type of content. And uh, the last is the temporal nature of the news, as I said. Uh, what we see here is a, is a time series number of page views of the Malaysia Airlines airplane when, when it fell down, right? And you can see that as it goes through time, and here is, you know, through the course of multiple weeks, you know, more information gets, some articles get published, the interest, you know, there's, there's new information, people are curious at the beginning, there's a huge spike, and then it has some sort of decay with certain periodic updates, and finally it flattens out. And that's kind of like the new cycle that lasts uh, for, a, for a story of that type that lasted across uh, multiple weeks. So uh, bringing the time factor, but not when the information is happening, but also when the information is being consumed, actually is also a very interesting uh, uh, problem. So uh, that's uh, all for my presentation. I would like to hear if you have any questions. Okay. Yeah, okay, so actually the, it's, a very, it's, a, it's, it's very comparable. I mean, the Stanford Recognizer, which is the core of the NLTK uh, toolkit, is state of the art, is considered state of the art, it's open source. So it uh, should, you know, our approach should not be behind that. So that, that's one way. Another thing that is between us, actually some, something that is very interesting. I worked on natural language as it happens in conversation, right? So for example, the conversation between humans in a call center that is very noisy. Human conversation is very unstructured. It's very elliptic. It's cut. It's irregular. While written, written text, especially news wires and news articles, is very regular. If you extend it into social text, right, what people write Twitters, then that's another story. But, but news articles is very clean, and therefore, you, with, a, with a reasonable approach, you should get state of the art. And those algorithms are published, right, the ones of the of, uh, Stanford toolkit. Basically, in this case, there was some discipline of a particular feature. What if that feature, how does the program know whether it was good or bad based on some other news article? Right. So the, the problem that we are addressing at, uh, is to the extraction of relationships, right? For this particular uh, you know, pipeline, we're not looking for sentiment. We're not doing a sentiment. Uh, we just decided to be, this to be a tool that will support the, the creation of hypotheses that go to our teams of analysts that generate databases like risk and compliance. And there's no judgment of positive or negative polarity. It just happens to be that Osama bin Laden is uh, related through some political organization to you know, the prince of some other country or something like that. Right? It's not, there's no subjectivity there. Thank you. OK. Maybe one, one last question. Yeah, um, you said that um, you're more interested in the relationships. So, um, let me just throw in an hypothesis that um, let's say if you have this like this nice, nice net of uh, relationship and then let's say there's news about someone within that net, then you kind of maybe uh, interpret or infer from that that maybe something will happen upper in the, in the kind of like you have a predictive about what will happen upper in the Net, am I yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's an application, right, of, of something that could be done with, with these kind of uh, uh, relations, right? You can do, uh, for example, if you find that, you know, uh, Twitter and Instagram have, relation, have created this adversarial relationship, right, then you can, you know, cumulate, accumulate all this evidence through the years and find out that, yes, it might be predictive for some, you know, perhaps... Uh, correlated movement of uh, stock, for example. I, I don't know, I'm just here uh, improvising, but it could be applied to that. We, we are not uh, applying it on that, though. Excellent. All right. Juan Huerta, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>